Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about Taproot and Graphroot. A um, couple ideas that have come into the space in the past year for um, scripting languages or replacements thereof. So the background here is that every every script type that I talked about before, previously, and other people have talked about are distinct. They look different. So from a kind of privacy perspective, that's pretty bad. You watermark, you know, you fingerprint yourself all the time. This makes things like fungibility worse. Um, Bitcoin isn't worth one Bitcoin anymore. Um, you have censorship risk and other issues. Um, also, um, if you're doing any kind of complex scripting, often you are paying for these contingencies that are never used. So um, in certain scripts you'll have, you know, the, th the thing you normally do, but once in a while you might need to use another clause in the script, and you have to pay for that every single time. So these kind of interesting cases that actually exist in real life, uh, you have kind of two cases. You have the cooperative case where everyone behaves, signs, and then updates the state. So in the M of N Schnorr case, which was just talked about, um, you know, this case will just look like one signature for one public key. But then you might have some compl complex uh, script as a backup measure. Say you expect maybe that a threshold is not enough um, and too many signers go offline. And after, say, a year or something, you want to recover the funds with a smaller uh, threshold. Um, with that, in a normal script, you'd have to say, you know, even with M, M of N Schnorr, you'd have check sig, uh, else, CSV, back off for, you know, however many blocks, and then another public key. Um, you also have things like time locks, hash pre-images, and what I just mentioned is the telescoping multi-sig case. Um, what if we could instead optimize for the first case if we believed it would be far more common? And then um, the participants would not have to pay for the contingency case, which also might be a much larger script. So in the Lightning Network case, the typical case is the two of two multi-sig, which with Schnorr could look like one. Um, with the kind of expensive um, scripts that punish um, the bad behavior or the unilateral closings, which means uh, if your cosigner in the in the channel goes offline, you have to spend more money to get your money back, and that's not great. Um, for telescoping multisigs, you have N of M multisig with a timeout to a small multisig, as I said. So there's a couple cases. Um, so there's been an idea where. Um, for privacy reasons, for example, you could have a Merkleized ab abstract syntax tree. Sorry, I didn't put it out there. Um, basically, have a Merkle tree that is an exclusive, an exclusive, uh, is a logical or. So you expose one of the leaves of this uh, tree, and that leaf would commit to a script. And as long as you satisfy that script, you can spend the, the funds. So, for example, you could have a Merkle tree of two with two leaves, and the left branch would be the common case, say. So everyone spends case, the uh, M of N Schnorr case, say. And then the right side would be some complex script you never really want to show off unless it really happens. Uh, so you'd only have to spend the funds to reveal the script and lose the privacy when this contingency is um, stumbled upon. Uh, you can also just have a subtree with many possible conditions attached. Um, for this to be privacy kind of preserving, everyone by default would have to do such a thing. Everyone would have to commit to a mass tree, even if you don't have a contingency. Um, most wallets today don't, right? It's simple, single signature, or maybe multi-sig. So everyone would have to pay this cost, which is kind of unlikely. Um, the one nice thing about it is there's no interactivity required on setup time. Um, downsides that most transactions do not have a requirement for this. 
uh, wasting bytes, and the bytes grows with the size of the tree. Um, and people would not be motivated to adopt such a thing. And that would be, politically speaking, a hard thing to get into Bitcoin as a standalone feature. Um, but one of the key insights was um, a way of adding the contingencies, adding these contingencies without uh, reducing, uh, without increasing cost or reducing privacy. So there's this concept called pay to contract, which I'm not sure I've been talked about today, so I'll go through it. Um, it's a method of committing to a specific message within a public key. So um, for example, in this Q equals P plus the hash of P uh, appended to the script times the generator G. So that's the public generator G for secp, lib secp, uh, secp 226k1. Um, and what happens is, let's say it's just a normal Bitcoin, sorry, normal Bitcoin um, public key address. You could take the queue, um, make a normal address out of it, and pay to it. And then you have provably bound it to this key P plus this message. So this message could be something like, in the element side chain specifically, for example, it's committing to an address that is that will be your address in the side chain. So consensus doesn't care about this in Bitcoin, but you're provably committing to this. Um, and only one binding is possible at a time. And, and the trick here is that if you can sign for if you if you can sign for P and have the message that's being hacked, the hash, uh, and having the script that's being hashed in, then you know how to spend it, spend the queue, and if and only if. Um, so we can commit to this contingency that we talked about inside of Bitcoin while maintaining just having this queue point be like a pay to pub key style address. And so the green script could be something like um, CSV uh, relative time lock of six months um, to a multi-sig of two to three, while the queue outside of this is being signed by an M of N federation of some sort that has done this key sh verifiable secret sharing um, scheme. Um, because every single participant in that scheme knows how to compute their own section of P, their own uh, shards of P, and they also know the hash of P appended to uh, script. Um, that's a, it's not a secret uh, among this federation, so they are able to all sign for this. Um, verifiers have no knowledge of this on the typical case. In the typical case, you'll, they will just sign for Q and it'll look like a normal pay to pub key output being spent. Um, the contingency is reveal P, the original pub key, reveal the script itself, and then verifiers are able to take P, add it with the hash of P appended to script through generator G, um, and they can verify that that adds up to Q, it's the same thing, and then you'd basically recurse into the script and treat that as some sort of contingency script. Could be a Bitcoin script, could be anything else. And again, there's no setup time interactivity required. Um, you could have a policy up front for every single output having the same contingency script and uh, you don't have to interact for that. Um, any questions? So the downside here is that the binding to the script here only means there can, there can only be one contingency. Or if you want additional contingencies, you have to embed it in a Merkleized abstract, abstract syntax tree, a mast, um, to have further revelations. But again, for each contingency that you have, it uh, increases the, uh, it should be n log n there, the cost. Um, so there might be another way to solve this, which was, um, kind of a revival of an old idea of delegation. So delegation is the method of you encumber funds into a, a script, and then at spending time, you basically say, okay, I'll spend it 
but then I'll hand this signed transaction to someone else and I've delegated say, okay, for this to be valid, now Bob has to sign for it as well. So adding additional um, encumbrances at spending time. Um, it's probably the reason for opcode separator. You can look that up. It's something that's not really used by, except by Nicola Doria, I think. Um, so at, so basically the typical setup would be you'd have this multi-sig people uh, doing the Schnorr kind of multi-sig for Q. So at creation time, all parties would delegate to another script by using using um, their shards of Q to sign a message that redelegates it, right? So the hash of Q um, appended to script two, where script two is actually the new encumbrance, this new secret encumber encumbrance. And you can do as many as you like, right? So you could sign as many scripts as you like independently. And as long as one of those is valid and attached to the transaction and fulfilled, then the transaction is valid. Um, so this does require that these signatures have to be stored, right? Before we had this non-interactivity that as long as you know your partner's public key shards ahead of time, you, you can um, do this without store, extra storage or interactivity. But now you have to have all participants send each other signatures and store them indefinitely. Um, so there's kind of the, the two, two major, uh, two, two ways have been thought of to increase the um, contingency sets without uh, reducing privacy. And this kind of dovetails with some stuff that John Newberry was talking about. Um, it's kind of these two schools of thought that you might, you know, scripting languages, if you add expressibility, it also tends to lower privacy as every new script is a, uh, is a privacy leak. It's a fingerprint risk. Um, and also, if not carefully designed, it increases the denial of service and consensus risk where the complexity means that every node has to compute it, compute the answer just as fast as um, you'd hope and also agree with other nodes, um, especially alternative implementations. And the other way is having less script or no script at all. So for the taproot and graftroot cases, you could just not have a script at all, but instead have a temp a, a, an actual template that says, you know, hash lock key or CSV key. And it's not interpreted as script, it's just a templated thing that people understand. Um, they optimize for the common cases and then you include more privacy by default, but also it's lower flexibility um, as well as lower risk. And uh, here's some background on some of the tools that people have done. The original paper for the paid contract paper at the bottom, a little tool you can play with, the contract hash functionality, and then the emails. So that's all I got. Thank you.